Well, good morning, everyone. We're great to be with you today. Uh, my name is Wade. I'm one of the pastors here at Stony Plain Alliance. So good to be with you on this really celebratory Sunday. Uh, for those in the room, welcome. For those joining us online, uh, welcome to you as well from wherever you happen to be in the world today. I'm going to introduce our guest teacher this morning in just a moment, but before I do, I want us to pause and quiet our hearts, and I want to lead us in prayer for some of the things happening in our community and happening in the world right now, and bring our hearts to Jesus as the one who is here to comfort and guide and give us wisdom in how to respond to all the things happening around us. So I invite you now uh, to bow your heads with me as I lead us in prayer. And as we've done many times, I encourage you to now stop. And stopping is really hard. And maybe you haven't stopped all week and it's just been go, go, go. And so I invite you to stop. And in stopping, uh, we also breathe. And so I invite you, take a big deep breath. Maybe it's been shallow breaths all week, maybe all morning. And yet God is inviting us to breathe. And when we breathe, we remember that we breathe the breath of God. The reason we have life at all is a gift from him, which reminds us that we have a soul. And our souls need attending to. And so in that quietness of stopping, of breathing, of remembering we have a soul, we then invite Jesus to be our teacher. To be the one that shows us the way into fullness of life. And it's already been happening. This room's full of life today. And yet Jesus has more for us. He's never done pouring out life and goodness upon us. And so now in this way of prayer, we also bring before you, Jesus, the things that are on our hearts. In our community, we think of those being displaced by fires in our province and across the country. God, the devastation of losing homes. Those who are just feeling, feeling the weight of what's happened in Jasper with all the things of memories and great times in the past. And our communities grieving and their communities grieving. And so I ask Jesus, we ask that you would keep your promise to comfort those who mourn. And that a river of comfort would open to those whose hearts are ready to receive that comfort. And God, that we as a community would rally around those who need help in practical ways. And we'd be responsive to the needs of our neighbors. Because that's what you call us to do. We think of the things happening in the world as conflicts in the Middle East continue. As uh, conflicts in South America continue. As conflicts in Asia continue. As conflicts across the African continent continue. And here in North America the polarization and tensions in our world. And Jesus, we ask you to guide your church in being a source of healing and restoration and reconciliation in all of these places. God, the scripture says that you so loved the world. You didn't love just some people. You didn't love uh, just a particular people. You loved the world. And so we pray today that you would give us your heart for the world. And we pray your peace and justice to reign, to roll like a mighty river like the prophets talk about. And that even as we prepare to hear the scriptures taught this morning, that we would be ready to be responsive. To say yes to you in whatever invitation you bring. And that these small invitations lead us to life. And they lead to those acts of reconciliation being felt in the world that is in so desperate need of your light and love. God, thank you for your presence with us. You are always attentive to us. We're not always attentive to you, but you are attentive to us. Help us now be attentive to you and how you are to us. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for praying with me, friends. Uh, we have the privilege this morning of welcoming uh, Clint Mix. Clint is one of my good friends, and uh, his wife just cheered for him. And uh, that was one cheer. That was really good. Uh, Clint, come on up. Why don't we welcome Clint? He's going to be preaching this morning. <clears throat> As I said, Clint is a good friend. He was actually my youth pastor for a while, so he's got stories, but so do I. And so we'll trade what stories are, are worse, but right now... Or we'll just agree. Or we'll just agree to... to trade stories yeah, to exactly. You might be muted still. Or maybe I... Maybe I'm talking. You better not saying anything like go. a sermon. Uh, Clint, <laughs> apart from also being a friend, uh, is one of our district leaders. So we're part of a denomination called the Christian Missionary Alliance, and a group of about 140 churches in Alberta, of which we're a part, that Clint help gives, helps give leadership to. And I've invited him to speak this morning. He's stepping right into our series in Luke, and we're so glad to have him. And I just want to pray for Clint, and then you can take it away. And so, Clint, I bless you in the name of Jesus, my friend, my brother, uh, my mentor. And thank you for coming today. And we give... Uh, we bless you, Clint, to bring the word that God has put on your heart. We're ready. We're open and receptive to whatever Jesus wants to say. 
calling us to fullness of life as we practice his way of life together. And so you're welcome here as family. You're welcome here to speak and bring that word to responsive and ready hearts. Jesus, thanks for the, the way of the spirit that draws us together in remarkable and miraculous ways. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Clint. We're with you. We're in this together. And we bless you to speak now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, cool. my friend. Thanks. Well, it is great to be here. Normally, I do bring greetings, which I'm going to do in a very unique way from our district family of churches, that 140-so congregations in Alberta and also in Northwest Territories. But quite recently, our Canadian family of churches, the Alliance, gathered together, and we do it every couple of years for something called a General Assembly, where we spend some time doing some productive things and other things in business meetings that we come together. But what we have together shared as a family of churches across the country is, is a bit of a similar culture and an identity, and it's sometimes called our vision prayer, and it says this, Oh God, with all our hearts, we long for you. Come, transform us to be Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, mission-focused people, multiplying disciples everywhere. This is our vision prayer. This is a part of who we are. And I know it's your heart's desire as a church to be centered on Christ, living in death to self, and empowered by the Holy Spirit and joining God in his mission of the reconciliation of all things. There's lots of reasons why I love to be here at Stony Plain. Your pastor mentioned our, our long-standing relationship where, was that 10 years ago you were in the youth group? Five or six years. I was doing the math today. I'm like, oh man, if he's really old, what does that make me? It was kind of a tragic accounting thing that just took place uh, in my mind. Uh, Wade and I had the privilege of serving together as well, and he baptized my wife after an Alpha conference, which was very uh, significant in her life and obviously in our life as well. And so he's also been a mentor and a friend to me as we've journeyed life together, and I commend him to you is someone who's giving that Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, uh, mission-focused leadership. But, but not just Wade, your whole staff. Uh, we are a family of churches, and we seek to serve interdependently. And so as your staff serve you very well, they also share their wisdom and knowledge with others. An executive pastor's network, a worship pastor's network, kids pastors, youth pastors, and serving beyond. And so we want to thank you as a church for the influence you've had on the broader uh, Western Canadian district of the Christian Missionary Alliance. But, but there's another one. Some of you who have been around uh, here for a while will know that your previous pastor, Graham, uh, when he was done here and he came, and Graham and I co-led a team together for a number of years, and we still serve together at the district. And here's where I would like to say thank you to you as a church, especially for those of you that participated with what Graham did in, in charting a way forward as you made your way into this facility. And I know the process that he went through, uh, kind of a discernment with the entire congregation, sometimes called appreciative inquiry. And you came up with this statement, and I think it'll be up on the screen. And this is your statement. You've heard it a number of times. This won't be new to you. But your guiding statement is fullness of life for everyone by practicing the way of Jesus. This is what you created together as a congregation, as you sought to listen to the voice of Jesus. And can I say, this is an amazingly great guiding statement. We need to invite people into something much better. And, and this is the abundant life or the fullness of life that Jesus talked about in John 10. Well, a little over a year ago, we went through a transition in the leadership in our own district office. And one of the first things that we did was come together and say, could we revisit our own guiding statements for our, our office, which serves churches? And here's what we came up with, and I want you to see the influence that you had on the entire district. So here's our current district statement, and it's actually quite new. It says this, we serve leaders of churches, or we serve leaders who invite others into fullness of life. Can you see the influence that you're having on the entire district? It is pronounced. And uh, I'm starting to hear it more and more from our licensed workers is we've tried to reposture ourselves to say, we're actually here for you. We are here to serve you, not, not tell you what to do. I like to tell churches, listen to Jesus <laughs> and respond in obedience. But we are here with you 
and we're here for you. And it is shaping the culture of our district, and so much of this happened because of the work that you did with your previous pastor and is spilling out and influencing others. So I do want to just stop and say to you, especially those of you that were a part of that process, your influence is pronounced, and it's needed, and I want to say thank you. Well, today we are here to talk about uh, the story of Luke, and uh, titled my message, Table Manners. But before we talk about your table manners, I'd like us to pray. Please join me. Jesus, I do thank you that you offer us fullness of life. And our heart's desire is to practice your way of living. And today, Jesus, as we look at the story from Luke chapter 5, we pray in all of our lives that you would, you would remind us in the gentle way that you do of how we can better align ourselves with who you are and the ways that you live. I thank you for the way already that Stony Plain Alliance Church is practicing your way, the table manners that they have. And for all of us to, to even more practice your way, we pray you'd guide and direct us today as we spend some time looking at your precious word. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, you know, sometimes preachers uh, tell stories and uh, then they get in trouble when they get home. Um, that might still happen, but I do have permission, like, you know, lawyers have been consulted, waivers have been signed. <laughs> My wife is in the room. <laughs> she knows where I'm going with this, so I do have her permission. One of the things that my wife and I really do love doing together is going golfing. Not a cheap sport. It's a time-consuming sport, but we really enjoy doing this together. Uh, reality was, it, it wasn't always an enjoyable experience uh, for us. So many years ago, we were, we were taking a holiday. We we're in a nice, warm, southern climate, and it's kind of our first time trying this thing out. We've been in the driving range. We're going to go golfing together, and... I'm getting a little antsy as I'm watching the time, and I'm, I'm starting to push my wife a little bit, like, come on, we've got to go, and I'm like, come on, we've got a tea time, come on, our tea time's coming, and she finally looks at me like, what are you talking about? We are going golfing. We're not having tea. Like, oh. Got it. Tea time. Like, sorry, if you're not a golfer, this may not all make sense to you, but it was really helpful Actually, for people who are new to church, we say stuff, and it's like, what are they talking about? Because she's like, we're, we're not drinking tea. We, we're, we're fine. I'm like, no, tea, you know. So it, it went on from there. I remember saying to her, aim for the green. And she looked at me like I'm absurd. It's all green. <laughs> and I said, avoid the bunker. What's a bunker? Well, it's, it's, it's the sand. It's called a sand trip. So she goes in the sand trap. I told her not to. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't. It's getting better. It's getting way better. And so I said, well, use your sandwich. She said, like, we just started. Why are we eating? No, sand wedge, not sandwich. So we learned that one. Uh, th then there was a time, there's multiple groups behind us. And if you're a golfer, you know the, the, car, you know, the, the bad things that are happening here. And we're in a nice, warm, tropical climate, and she pulls out her phone, and she starts taking pictures while, while people are waiting to hit on. And she's like, what are you so nervous about? What are you so stressed about? And, okay, this was the pinnacle, and this is the picture, and this is true. She drove the golf cart on the green right up by the hole, like the picture. And then she says to me, why are you so stressed? So it was a bit of a tense time in our relationship. There, there may have been a few tears along the way as I responded in maybe not the best way possible. If you're not a golfer, I apologize. But this is literally, I googled pictures of this. You know, I found that one. And they literally say, it's a cardinal sin. You know, like we're going to get kicked off the golf course and banned from golf for our entire lives. In the midst of these, you know, kind of interesting back and forth dynamics my wife and I are having, I'm like, well, how do I explain this to her? And, you know, a rare moment, I had a great epiphany, and I said to my wife, you know how, whether we're eating at home, just the two of us, or we're eating out, you really appreciate me using my manners. And she's like, yes, of course I like you using your manners. Again, not just when we're out, it's just the two of us having a, a meal together at home. I said, well, let me tell you about 
golf manners. And so that was the way we were able to say, you know, you like, you like to use table manners, you got to use golf manners. And now my wife is a golf expert. We're going to talk about her a little bit later. Great game, but she gets the manners now. But she likes to remind me of table manners. And her mom actually used to teach people table manners. And, you know, you have this idea where somehow you're supposed to start at the outside of the cutlery and then work your way in like that. And then the ones up top, like, I think they're for dessert. I'm still not sure, you know, when you're done your meal and, you know, you just, you know, do you put the serviette on the table or do you leave it on the chair? I, I don't know. We're still growing in our whole uh, table manners piece that we're doing. And when you stack dishes after the meal, you're not actually allowed to stack them on top of each other. I don't know if that's just a my house rule or other rules, but you keep them separate. These are all the table manners. Am I in trouble when I get home? <laughs> I'm in trouble right after this. So we should use our table manners. Now, table manners aren't just only for those that are fine dining or dining at home. Jesus actually had table manners as well. And so I want you to read and listen to the table manners of Jesus. And it's a part of your series in Luke chapter 5, verses 27 to 31. And I'm going to be reading from the message of this. And we're going to see some of the manners, the table manners that Jesus had. Luke 5, verse 27. After this, Jesus went out and saw a man named Levi at his work collecting taxes. Jesus said, come along with me. And he did. Walked away from everything and went with him. Levi gave a large dinner at his home for Jesus. Everybody was there, tax men and the other disreputable characters as guests at the dinner. The Pharisees and the religion scholars came to his disciples greatly offended. What is Jesus doing eating and drinking with misfits and sinners? Jesus heard about it and spoke up. Who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? I'm here inviting outsiders, not insiders, an invitation to a changed life, changed inside and out. Well, I've got a few table manners of Jesus, and here's the first one. Everybody, all people, especially the misfits, are welcome at the table of Jesus. Our narrative begins by Jesus inviting one of the most despised categories of people at that time and place to come and to be his apprentice, to follow him. And it was someone named Levi, and he was a tax collector. And what, I mean, we don't like tax collectors now, but back then what they did was they took money from their people or even God's people, and they gave it to these pagan Roman occupiers. You're taking my money and giving it to people that don't even believe in our God? And like, how could this be? You know, Jesus uh, claiming to be the Son of God, the, the Messiah, the one that was coming to liberate them, to save them, inviting one of those people to, to be his closest followers. <laughs> to, to most despised people in the culture at that time, Jesus said, come along with me, be with me. I love your calling as a church, and you've heard it a number of times, you know, Fullness of life for all, practicing the way of Jesus. Stoney, if that's more than an empty, feel-good, evangelical rhetoric that we say to ourselves, about ourselves, to make us feel good about ourselves, then like Jesus, this, this table manner of saying, everybody is welcome. You need to be welcoming to people, all people. Jesus invited us to his table. We need to be reciprocating to the, to the Levi's of our day. Well, if practicing the way of Jesus means anything, it means time at the table. I, I know there's not a, a table here uh, with us, but the table can also be a metaphor for our faith, for our gathering. Uh, come to the table. Some churches gather in homes and they gather around a table as well. And sometimes there's a, a, a literal table that takes place. So it's, it's not just a metaphor, but it is also a way of saying we come together. We gather. This, this gathering here and now is, is in one sense, we've gathered around the table of Jesus together. I get it's a different setup than having a table in the middle, but it symbolizes the church gathered together, even as we will do in a short while, celebrating the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. 
The table doesn't belong to Stony Plain Alliance Church or the Alliance Canada. It's actually Jesus' table. And all who want to come and experience the grace of Jesus are welcome. All who are curious about Jesus, all who are rejected by the religious elite are come, and they are welcome as well. This, this chasm that exists between kind of the table and how people feel, the, the sinners, the tax collectors, the misfits, the losers, and all kinds of sinners... It can be so pronounced in our church culture today. Tragically, while Jesus welcomes all people, anybody who wants to come to the table of Jesus, Jesus welcomes. We're not always that way today. Uh, many religious people uh, do not welcome people to the table. And when the religious elite saw what Jesus was doing and who he was doing it with, they were greatly offended. They could not imagine anybody, let alone someone saying they're the Son of God and the Messiah, coming and, and hanging out with people, let alone having what seemed to be a, a party with these people. And Jesus wasn't even condemning them. He was hanging out and having fun. Okay, I might confess that sometimes people in our community can be more fun than people in our churches, but I won't say that out loud because this is being recorded he was there enjoying himself how is it that jesus makes the a-list of party invites and we often don't get invited most churches see themselves as uh, we sang a song you know a lighthouse sometimes churches will say well we're a hospital where people can come we often see ourselves this way but i can assure you society does not see us the way that we see ourselves it's an older book, but it's a great book. And it's called What's So Amazing About Grace, and it's by Philip Yancey. And he opens this book with a story. It's told to him by a friend, and I'm going to read a, a segment of it that would be from the friend's perspective. And this friend served the impoverished and addicted in Chicago. Uh, this is from the book What's So Amazing About Grace. This is the author's friend speaking. He said this, A prostitute came to me in wretched straits, homeless, sick, Unable to buy food for her two-year-old daughter, through sobs and tears, she told me she'd been renting out her daughter, two years old, to men. She made more renting out her daughter for one hour than she could earn on her own in a night. She had to do it. She had to support her own drug habit. Again, this is the friend speaking. I could barely hear her sordid story. For one thing, it made me legal liable. I'm required to report cases of a child abuse. I had no idea what to say to this woman. At last, I asked her if she had ever thought of going to church for help. I'll never forget the look of pure, naive shock that crossed her face. Church, she cried. Why would I ever go there? I was already feeling terrible about myself. They would just make me feel worse. That's that gap that exists between what we think we are and usually want to be, and what so many people outside of our church circles experience from us. One of the things that I work with, even within our own denomination, is something called our, our Women's Leadership Collective. And I'm embarrassed to say, I don't know of a female pastor in the Alliance that hasn't experienced something like this. They, they may be out there. I, I hope they're out there, <laughs> some of our, our female pastors. But everyone I've talked to has narratives of exclusion, of hurtful statements, of demeaning comments. Let me tell you my story, which I've only once shared in a sermon before, and that was uh, at previous church I was on staff at, Foothills, where I actually did my story with divorce as a sermon, and I've never mentioned it in another sermon. And one of the reasons I don't mention it is because I get fearful when I do. Because my own story, when uh, my marriage ended over 20 years ago and I single-parented for a period of time, it meant exclusion from my vocational role. And now I have my tension in my body as I share that even here and now. And it, it resulted in me being not allowed at the table for a long period of time. Even at Foothills, which is a great church, and embraced me and I was an executive pastor there, 
they asked me one year to share it, and I said, no. I'm afraid I'll get up and share my story, and it'll create such a problem that I'll, I'll face the same exclusion again. It's still one of my least favorite places to be is in a room full of church people, and people think it's funny given what my day job is. But I do. I have that sense of stress of you don't have those 2.5 kids anymore in this pretty life, and you know, now you're one of them. But I've thought of my own experience as, as a divorced person in ministry. I've thought of the experience of so many female leaders that I've talked to, and I just think, if, if I get stressed when I go into a room full of church people, there are so many other groups within our society that have it way worse than I do. How would some of these other groups of people feel to say, hey, come to the table, you're welcome. I'm like, you're not really welcome, and if you are, it tends to be at the little table over there in the corner. Friends, reject the religious spirit of the Pharisees. It's tragically prevalent in the church today. And instead, practice the way of Jesus by welcoming all people, especially the misfits, to the table of Jesus. So, first rule. Ah, not rule. That would be against Jesus' way of doing it. <laughs> first manner. Everybody should be welcome at the table of Jesus. Let me give you another manner of Jesus as well, another table manner, a second one. A second one is this, and I struggled a bit to how to put it together, and you can see it's, it's consider or join in Jesus' invitation to practice his way. Uh, here's where I struggled with how to describe this a little bit. Uh, consider kind of seems soft. Like, well, just, you know, you want to think about it. Join in seems like too forceful. I think that the spirit of Jesus and the spirit of how we should be around the table is, is likely somewhere in between this. We see it in our text today, and we see it whenever we read about Jesus. It's always an open-ended open -ended and open-handed invitation. And, and the reality is not everybody took it. We think of the story of the rich uh, ruler, and Jesus said, come and follow me. Now, you're going to have to sell your stuff and give money to the poor, and the rich young ruler said, I, I don't think I can do it. And I love that Jesus didn't chase after him and say, oh, okay, we'll just sell a little bit then, or, or you can come. He's like, no, this, this is who we are. This is the table of Jesus. And there's always this open invitation to a changed life. Take it or leave it. Even in John 6, where Jesus does some kind of unique teaching about the sacrifice of his body, and, and a bunch of people left, and he even said to his own disciples, you're free to go. Nobody is forcing you to stay. Nobody makes you follow Jesus. And the way of Jesus, and I think we as the church should learn from this, he never guilts, he never manipulates, he never forces. He says, here I am. Come, come along with me at your pace, at your time. Revelation uh, 3 verse 20 says this, uh, behold, I stand at the door and knock, right? This is Jesus actually speaking to followers of him, to a church to say, even those of us who have chosen to follow Jesus, Jesus never forces us. He always invites us into his way. Uh, we see this later in Luke chapter 14, same uh, book that we're in today where Jesus uses another table metaphor and he has a great feast and he says, go out to the, the highways and the ends and just invite everybody to come as well. We also see it in the last part of our passage in Luke chapter 5 where Jesus responds to the criticisms of the religious elite, and he says to them, who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? Jesus said, I'm here inviting outsiders, not insiders, and it's an invitation to a changed life. What is the way of Jesus? What is Jesus' table manner? Everybody's welcome, and we invite you to this changed life, a life that changes us from the inside out. I think the only exception that Jesus makes is when he's talking to hmm, people like me, you know, kind of people in the, in the business, as it were. When Jesus would talk to the religious elite, he's a little more forceful then. You know, he'd say stuff like, 
whitewashed tombs, meaning you're dead on the inside, but you look pretty on the outside. You know, those two types of things are a brood of vipers. Why? Because Jesus was so passionate that all people are welcome at his table. Jesus was so passionate that, that people practice the way of Jesus by, by invitation, by being invited into it, not by being guilted or manipulated or cajoled or, or condemned or threatened. It's not the way of Jesus. Scripture reminds us that one of the roles of the person of the Holy Spirit is to convince people of their sin. When people come to the table or people are a part of your church, it's not your job to be the Holy Spirit. It's not your job to judge them and tell them what they're doing wrong. Allow them to see a, a different way, a better way. Allow Jesus and the work of Scripture to invite people into his way. It's not your job. It's not my job. It's not your pastoral staff's job either. Jesus, his word, and the Holy Spirit invite people into fullness of life. In, in past years, there's this disastrous statement that I would hear church people say, uh, you know, love the sin or hate the sin. I was like, oh man, that's, that's just disastrous. Like even in my own journey with divorced people would say, oh, whatever. I'm like, anyway, it, it never went across great. Um, I did work with the Baptists for a number of years in Ontario, and a friend there had this incredibly poignant nuance that I think ties together these two manners really well. What if we took this approach? Love the sinner, hate your own sin. I've got enough of my own, <laughs> you've got enough of your own. Let's not worry about other people. Let's hate our own sin in our lives. So table manner one, everybody, especially the misfits, they're welcome at the table of Jesus. Table manner two, just invite people to practice the way of Jesus. Invite people into this changed life, this fullness of life that we're talking about. Well, uh, back to my wife and her golf game. Uh, last year, we went out golfing with some very dear friends. And, you know, it, from a golf perspective, my wife was a misfit. She didn't have table manners. But we golfed, good friends, always fun to be with them, you know, hang out a little bit afterwards. So we're driving home, it's just the two of us in the car. And my wife says to me, you know, I won't name the person, but this person walked on my line before I was putting. Now, if you're not a golfer, the thing is, you know, you're putting your putt and it's over there. And conceivably, if you step, and the person was wearing running shoes, not even spikes, you know, conceivably, at my weight, you might make a divot in the green, but, you know, you maybe make a slight nuance and make your ball go away. It, it, it is bad golf etiquette to walk on somebody's line. But it was pretty fun to go home and be able to say to my wife, you know you drove the golf cart on the green, <laughs> and now you're worried about somebody else walking on your line. And I do have permission, waiver signed, uh, to tell these stories. But, but it's remarkable to me how, oh, by the way, you know, my wife did teach me a couple things. I knew about foot wedge, if you're a golfer, you know, it really helps your score a lot. She also taught me another one, it's called a pocket wedge. So when you lose your ball, just drop it up. <laughs> She does give lessons. <laughs> How quickly we can go from being someone included in the family of God. And honestly, when we pursue and practice the way of Jesus, our, our lives aren't perfect. Stuff still happens. Divorces still happen. You know, crises still happen. But, but oftentimes our lives are changed and changed for the better. We learn about serving others and we get back from that. We learn about living lives, as you talk about, with generosity. And, and God seems to bless and then we're blessed financially. We, we treat our spouses better and have better families. And we treat our kids better and they us better. And you can see there's this qualitative difference in following the way of Jesus. But in the midst of experiencing that, like those Pharisees, how quickly it can turn to looking down at others. So here's rule number three, or manner number three. When you stop using your manners, remember manners one and two. Can I tell you something that happened to me this morning? So uh, when is Rick preaching here? Three weeks. Uh, Reverend Dr. Rick Strangway, a good friend, he's actually preaching with your uh, sisters and brothers at Spruce Grove Alliance this morning. 
we both knew we're being here. He lives in Calgary where I do. So we grabbed a coffee at Starbucks this morning, and, and it was kind of fun. What are you preaching? What are you preaching? We prayed for each other. Really enjoyable experience uh, I had this morning. Sitting there talking with Rick. Somebody comes in, you know, to the, the order thing. They're wearing a suit and a tie and look super churchy. And I judged them. I judged them. I did that this morning, just a couple of hours ago. Why? Oh, he's probably this, he's probably that. J Jesus loves religious people too. And we're all invited to the table. And it's so easy for any of us, I did it two hours ago, to sit there and look down on someone. Because you're dressed up on a Sunday morning, oh, you're clearly judgmental, you're against me, you're this, this, and this. I didn't know any of that. He might have been going to a funeral. I don't know. I'm assuming he's going to a Bible thumper church. <laughs> but this religious judgmental spirit is in me, and it's in all of us. And we invite people to the table, and we invite them into the way of Jesus. And we need to be reminded that that invitation is always there for all of us to come back to the table. When we devolve to this, as I did this morning, we're all partaking in that religious spirit and we're forgetting our manners. And so when you find yourself in a good space in life, starting to look down at somebody else, circle back. Everybody's welcome. Even religious people. Jesus loves them too. And we're all invited to follow the way of Jesus. You're a great church. Thank you for your influence on our district. Jesus wants you to be a church where all people, especially the misfits, are welcome. And I'm going to encourage you to continue to commit to practice the way of Jesus by graciously receiving and reciprocating his invitation to follow him to a fullness of life, to a changed life. And that when you forget your manners, circle back and do it again. Jesus, I thank you for Stony Plain. I thank you that for such a time as this, you've invited them to try to model what this means in, in all of their imperfections, in all of our imperfections. And we commit to following you and to following your way. I know you celebrate Eucharist or the Lord's Supper uh, weekly, and I asked Wade if I could do this transition, and, and he said yes. So <laughs> uh, the table of Jesus is before us, or uh, again, in your hands. Uh, most often during this, and I've been in the church for, uh, well, pushing 60 years now, most often we, uh, you know, somebody like Wade comes up and he reads from 1 Corinthians 11 and they remind you, don't participate in an unworthy manner. And almost always I've heard people say, that means you have to know Jesus and if you haven't decided to follow Jesus, don't partake. And you have to be in right relationship with other people. And friends, if you don't know Jesus, I would encourage you to follow Jesus. And if you have something between you and somebody else, I'd encourage you to make it right. But the actual context of 1 Corinthians 11, if you read it, it's, they, they weren't having Eucharist in the sense of just let's remember Jesus' sacrifice. They were having what we might call a potluck today, but they weren't doing it for fellowship so much as I have food and you don't have food, why don't you come? But they were abusing that and they were being gluttonous and some were getting drunk and they weren't sharing and Jesus says, no way. That's not the way of my table. The, the people at the table were treating the marginalized in their society, and this would have been an economic marginalization. They were treating them less than. So everybody is welcome at the table. Now, if you want to be blasphemous to Jesus, don't partake. But if you're curious, if you're in need of grace, if you're a misfit, Jesus says, come to the table. Whatever you have going on, it's okay. Jesus says, come. Come and partake. There's a spot at a table for all of us. Religious, irreligious, those who fit, those who don't. Come to the table of Jesus. So if you haven't received the elements yet, I invite you to go to one of the stations and get the bread and the cup for those online. Find some bread, some juice, some wine. And we're going to take 
the bread together. So let's start by taking the bread. And we'll break it in our hands, just as I have done. And just hold it for a moment as we consider where this is a call to remembrance to what Jesus has done, to what Jesus is doing and what Jesus will do. We've heard this morning about the open table, and every single weekend we say this, and I'll state it again, as Clint has already stated. If you're wondering if you're allowed at the table, if there's a place for you, is there only one question? Are you in need of God's mercy? If that answer is yes, I want God's mercy, then the table is for you. If you're not interested in mercy, you do not have to partake, and Jesus never coerces or manipulates. It's not who he is. But for all those who are in need of mercy, we remember Jesus, because on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he says, this is my body, which is broken for you. You come broken, Jesus says, I have wholeness. And I'll make the great exchange. I will give you wholeness. I will take on your brokenness. And we remember in the breaking of the bread, he is the one that is calling us to life. And so we remember Jesus as we partake together. Let's eat. Scripture goes on to say that in the same way after supper, Jesus took a cup, a cup of wine, and said this, this cup is a new covenant, a new way of relationship between God and people. It's not about performance. It's not about doing it perfect. It's the way of grace. It's the way of mercy. And for each one of us who will receive this mercy today, I think we've been encouraged that what is poured into us now becomes the overflow that we give to others. And so we drink this cup in remembrance of Jesus, the one who poured out mercy to us, so we'll pour it out to others. Let's drink together. And in taking the bread and the cup, partaking of Jesus and being part of community, every weekend again, we remember the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ that's been proclaimed today, and I will proclaim it again. This is the gospel. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ is reigning. And Christ will come again. Amen. Let's stand and sing together as we close.